BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Nerd 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday. Time for the AMA. Welcome to the show. This is the Ask Me Anything, where I respond to your questions and comments, and we go through the material together, having a discussion. And if there are any questions that you would like to ask for a future Ask Me Anything, you can put them in the comments section below. You can also write me at blackboxonlineradio at aol.com. In the past, I often began these things with a borrowed question, which was something that came from a different source, or it didn't come from the comment section on YouTube or the DMs on Instagram or the email that I just mentioned. It was from just any piece of literature. Usually it was like an icebreaker, nothing to do with um, any of the things like the Zodiac Killer or some of the other true crime cases that we'll be talking about today. But this one is a borrowed question that is Zodiac Killer related. Right now I have my copy of... Zodiac Killer, Just the Facts, Tom Voigt's book, which is um, a compilation of the police reports, if you will, and on the back of it, it says, Can you solve the Zodiac Killer case? What a good question. The short answer is no, and the long answer is, for some guy like me, what I, I had to make this decision a long time ago, I'm going to talk about the Zodiac Killer a lot, as well as a whole bunch of other true crime cases, whether it's the disappearance of Moore Murray or the disappearance of Brandon Lawson, the murder of Missy Beavers. I'm fascinated by them. I want to know what happened, what, yeah, what happened to those individuals, and what is the conclusion to the story, as well as getting justice for all of the people who would be involved by them, who have a definitive first-hand connection to these cases. And there are even still people who are related to the Zodiac Killer victims who are still alive to this day, but would I actually be able to solve the Zodiac Killer mystery? I doubt it. So what I decided that this channel could do is maybe do some things that would help along the way, at least have a very strong stance on certain suspects, and that's one point that I talked about in 2019. I was like, Maybe, just maybe, Black Box Online Radio could eliminate certain Zodiac Killer suspects and give very hard reasons about why this person wasn't the Zodiac Killer, why this particular narrative is wrong, and it's so much more than just one single person. Maybe a person with this type of biometrics could not have committed the crime, or a person who was... um involved with uh, certain disciplines academically could have only come up with these types of ideas or they had this type of training that type of thinking maybe that could happen here on pbor but i can't do it without you guys so if you have anything that you would like to share about the zodiac killer mystery please put your ideas in the comment section below as well as any of the other um true uh, crime cases that we're going to be talking about here and there's another reason why I chose to use this borrowed question, because I now have this book, Zodiac Killer, Just the Facts. I wanted to do this as a type of multi-part discussion, and that will be coming out Friday on the Anything Goes segment. Most of the time, the Anything Goes is just a free-for-all, any subject is fair game. But because of this book, I wanted to divide up the sections of the book and talk about several of the Zodiac crimes and the, um, the material that has been presented in this, which is the police reports in order, and look at what um, we can share. So they'll be like, I'm hoping to do one on the Lake Herman Road murders and then on the Blue Rock Springs shooting, the Lake Berryessa stabbing, and so on. At least four segments, but, uh, you know, knock on wood that that'll happen. Always there can be new things going on in the news and such, and there can be new breakthroughs in any part of the true crime world. But please tune in fr Friday if you would like to hear something about that, a book discussion on Zodiac Killer, Just the Facts. All right, now moving on to your questions and comments. 
from for today's AMA. I would like to begin with our first question, and that comes to us from Mr. Barlow, who says something on the murder of Paul Stein Q&A session. How are people able to devote energy to a theory that the Zodiac was made up by the media? Question mark, question mark, question mark. My goodness, shaking my head. Oh, when I first learned that theory, I was right on the same page with you, Mr. Barlow. I was just so caught off guard. I thought it was so implausible because you're talking about the Zodiac hoax theory, more or less. And there's a book out there called The Myth of the Zodiac Killer that I talk about a lot. And there are other people who um, believe that theory, not only the author of that book, Thomas Henry Horan, but other people um, have written into the channel and they've shared their reasoning. The Zodiac hoax theory was something that I just thought it was the most far out thing in the world. There was no Zodiac killer. It was a hoax that was created by the San Francisco News Chronicle. In short, did I say that right? The San Francisco Chronicle, the newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle. Hope I said that clearly. And the short version is they wanted to create a murder mystery that couldn't be solved to pull people into the world of buying newspapers and so on. Now that means that real murders happened, but then somebody wrote letters taking credit for murders that he did not commit. And this goes all the way back to Jack the Ripper, because I've been meaning to do an episode for the Anything Goes segment, and I hope this will come out at some point in the future, to talk about the Jack the Ripper hoax theory, because that is very similar. I mean, it's saying that Jack the Ripper was created by the media. The newspapers were involved with... um. Well, the the murders that took place, real murders took place, but it's the pieces of writing that unified all of those crimes that took place, the Whitechapel murders and so on. And I said pieces of writing because it's not only um, letters that have been mailed in. Of course, you'll have other things like the Saucy Jackie postcard, the way that the Zodiac Killer didn't only write letters. He also mailed in the Halloween card as numerous other pieces of info. I mean, especially the unconfirmed ones, such as the Eureka card, which was mailed as late as 1990. I mean, many pieces of writing from the Zodiac Killer. But the thing that I was really thinking about was both Jack the Ripper and the Zodiac Killer left behind messages nearby to nearby where the victims were murdered. And in, um, in the second to the last crime, Jack wrote uh, something on a building wall. And of course, the Zodiac Killer wrote a message on the car door at Lake Berryessa. And that is one of the few things that connects all of the crimes, cars and automobiles and so on. There just has to be something related to cars. And when I was discussing this with somebody in the comments section, when I did the uh, Jack the Ripper versus the Zodiac Killer episode, and he it was actually his observation, I think it might have been Jerry B. who pointed that out. But I was like, okay, I follow what you're saying. The Zodiac was at Lake Berryessa. There were no buildings around, so he had to write a message on the car door. And I do think the Zodiac was um, influenced by Jack the Ripper, but there were numerous other influences on the Zodiac Killer. No matter what, I don't think one piece of literature was the foundation or the sole playbook. Like Skating Crow Productions asked the question that way. Was the Zodiac Killer using this piece of literature as a playbook? Maybe, but there are just too many um, influences to count. So, how would the media go about making up something like this? Well, with Jack the Ripper, you would also have to have an additional layer that gets even crazier. For the Ripper hoax theory, somebody would have had to also have mutilated the bodies, with the exception of the murder of Long Liz Stride, who was, um, her throat was slashed, but her body wasn't mutilated, and they think that either the real Ripper was interrupted and then ran off to somebody else, or that, um, she was, uh, murdered, and then there were just two different murders that took place in a very similar um, very small time window, like a very, sh like there was only about like one hour in between the murder of Liz Stride and the murder of, uh, Catherine Eddowes. So uh, it seems, but I, I don't even want to uh, misstate some of those, uh, time frame things because I'm not a ripper expert. And then you got people who are learning about murders that took place, whether it's London or San Francisco, murders are happening. And then 
someone is sending in these pieces of writing, taking credit for murders that they did not commit. And is it all just to fuel up the, uh, the, uh, newspaper business? Or maybe they just get off on telling people things that are not true. That could also be a factor. I thought it was the craziest thing in the world, but... Believe it or not, the more I looked into the hoax theory, I began to like that angle of it more, that uh, you wouldn't have any of the grand conspiracy, you wouldn't have any of the parts that would involve the um, CIA, or um, you wouldn't have any of this uh, Zodiac Manson angle, or you wouldn't have anybody um, trying to do this as a like thrill kill club in some ways instead it would just be maybe three guys sitting around and they decided hey yeah this is what we're gonna do and um they come up with this game plan and the way that i imagined it happening had nothing to do with the cia nothing to do with um any of these types of uh, larger conspiracy layers but someone is just saying something about jack the ripper and then somebody turns to him and says you don't understand, there was no Jack the Ripper, and here's how they did it. And then one of those people may have been working for the San Francisco Chronicle, and then they had the idea, well, hey, we can do that. All we need is somebody to write in these letters, especially somebody from law enforcement who would know how to do it without getting caught. But um, I, I don't endorse that now, because of all of the red flags that you encounter in that, and if anything, I mean, I know it's conspiratorial, but if there is any type of Zodiac hoax going on, I think the CIA angle is stronger than uh, just uh, three guys sitting around trying to um, pull off a very adult-like prank. And this is definitely something for the grown-up mind. I mean, if that is what happened, but, I mean, I want to be clear, I do not endorse that theory. That is not even my theory at all. That is just, you know, something that came to mind one day when I should have been doing other work and thinking about other stuff. Now, I would like to go on to something else in the Zodiac world, and this is on the Zodiac suspect Macduff. He has been in the news a lot lately, and... Some people think that Michael Morford has found the guy, he has found the Zodiac Killer, and in the most recent Zodiac Mondays episode, I said that I thought the biggest piece of evidence in favor of Macduff being the Zodiac Killer was the time frame, like the chronology, that the Zodiac ceased activity for 1972 and 1973, and then um, there's the Exorcist letter that comes in 1974. And some people think that that is putting an end to the Zodiac Killer persona. It talks about plunging into the suicide uh, grave, the billowy way of the suicide grave, Titwillow, Titwillow, Titwillow. It's reference to the Mikado. But some people think that that's not an actual suicide note. It's just the Zodiac is saying that he's putting an end to the character. With this suspect Macduff that um, Mike Morford has discovered, and that's just his middle name. We're not revealing his full name here on this channel, even though many of you guys already know. I thought that was important because he starts a job with the Department of Corrections in 1971, and then he gets married in 1974. So there's almost more focus on him in 1971, maybe regular background checks, or maybe people would be more inclined to look into... um his forensic material and so on, especially fingerprints, and, um, I mean, something to that effect. He is a state employee. Also, for the simple fact that he began to sort his life out, that means he didn't have a career, and he wasn't married prior to 1971, hence the sexual frustration, and when he wants to go out and, um, terrorize the Bay Area... But then 1974, right before he gets married, he puts an end to the Zodiac Killer mystery, meaning that it's all about sexual frustration. And we have a question that comes to us from Kevin Bowen, who says, Was he the only guy who got a job in 1971? Oh, no, absolutely not. Many people got jobs in 1971, but I like the way that you think, Kevin Bowen, because it's entirely possible that everything I just said about McDuff could be irrelevant, or it could mean that Macduff wasn't the Zodiac. I mean, that is not damning evidence. That is just something that made sense to me. And a lot of the times, 
when people are sharing these pieces of info, it, um, I really have to look at the points that just, am I able to understand it? Am I able to follow it in a logical sequence? Is this what I think this type of person would do? And as I said, I mean, it's definitely not going to be solving every single mystery under the sun that way, but maybe you could try and figure out a few more things. Now, there's one point in that most recent episode talking about the Zodiac Killer suspect list for and against that you can hear on this channel, and yeah, that's the um exact title of it, Zodiac Killer suspect list for and against. I invite all of you to listen to that. In that one, there's one line that I forgot to say, and that is that almost every piece of evidence that I thought was really good for a Zodiac suspect was related to storytelling because they've established a narrative that I think makes sense to me, especially Bruce Davis as a Zodiac suspect when I said that Howard Davis put forward the theory that the authorities figured out who the Zodiac killer was and they knew, they knew who he was. His name was Bruce Davis. He was Charles Manson's right-hand man. And not only that, Charlie Manson ordered the Tate LaBianca murders as well as the Zodiac murders and the reason why they didn't arrest Bruce Davis or couldn't convict Bruce Davis for the Zodiac murders is he was already going to jail for life. At the time, it was death, but then they commuted the sentences to life. Then California banned the death penalty for a short time, and then they brought it back. But those commuted sentences remained. Like That's why all the Manson family members who went to jail for life did not have their sentences altered after that. So, he's already going to jail for the rest of his life. They weren't going to extradite him to a different jurisdiction and go through the two million dollar trial. They're like, okay, this is the end that we're going to get. Yeah, that makes sense to me. That is something that I can definitely comprehend, but is that what actually happened? Uh, that's a storytelling element. That's a storytelling mechanism, and almost every suspect that I was talking about last time those are the things that stood out to me the best. Somebody is weaving a good story. And that's even the points that I brought up about Macduff. I mean, okay, this guy was the Zodiac Killer, and then his life was a mess, and then he got a job, he started a career. And Macduff actually worked for the Department of Corrections for 30 years, I believe. That was his career. I mean, don't quote me on that number, but like he spent the majority of his working life at that job. And then he got married in 1974 and then puts an end to everything. All right, that's a good story. But, well, I mean, actually, it's a horrible story. Someone's a serial killer because they can't get their rocks off with a girl. It's like, oh, hey, I got a new job. Oh, hey, f I finally found a girl. Now I'm cool. Um, that's a terrible story, to be honest. But it's a storytelling element all the same. So, I mean, I really wanted to provide that condition in there at the end. So... I mean, if you want to disagree with me on any of those points about McDuff or the hoax theory, please uh, put your ideas in the comment section below, or if you have anything to say about Bruce Davis and the Zodiac Manson connection, I would also like to read that. But I have something very big to talk about in terms of Charles Manson, so please stay tuned, and we will continue with that right after this message. You are listening to Black Box Online Radio. This show is brought to you by Teespring. Feel free to check out the merchandise. Almost all sizes and colors are listed. Black Box Online Radio. And remember YouTube Premium. You can download the show, take it on the go, anywhere and anyhow. Please like and subscribe. Grazie mille. Okay, hello and we are back. In a recent episode, I said that I had started listening to the Tate LaBianca radio program, and I wanted to make it a type of goal, or what I call a project, to listen to as many episodes as I could. Okay, that's not true. I said I wanted to listen to all of the episodes, but there are many. The Tate LaBianca radio program, which is hosted by Brian Davis here on YouTube, you can find that. And I think there are still regular weekly live streams coming out on Sundays at 8 p.m., and it comes from Roanoke, Virginia, not too far from me in the great state of West Virginia. But um, I want to share some things about that in just a second. But first, we do have one more Zodiac question that comes to us from Dragar, who says, Nid, 
Have you ever considered discussing writer Glenn Wall's suspect, William Thorinson III? He's the focus of Wall's book, Zodiac Maniac, The Secret History of the Zodiac Killer. I have never heard of this guy, the author, or the suspect, and uh, this is why I need you guys in the comment section. You share things with me all the time. Yeah, I would love to look into this one a little bit more. Thank you, Dragar, for the suggestion. And if anybody else wants to get a head start, Glenn Wall's suspect, William Thorinson III, he's the focus of the book, Zodiac Maniac, The Secret History of the Zodiac Killer. I like different types of ideas. And when I was listening to this show, the Tate LaBianca radio program, the host, Brian Davis, um, asked a particular question that I've never really heard anyone ask before in the true crime world. And he said, what is the significance of Tom O'Neill's Chaos? And to provide some context, Chaos is a book by Tom O'Neill, and it's the full title is Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the Secret History of the 60s. The reason why this guy Brian Davis was asking the question is, in the world of Manson family exploration, the world of people who are still trying to learn more about the Tate LaBianca murders, as well as the murder of Gary Hinman and Shorty Shea, the shooting of Bernard Crow, all of the crimes connected to the Manson family. Some people still think there are things that not only we do not know, but that the mainstream media got the narrative horribly wrong. All of that. And in the past two years, really it's the past 18 months in 2020 and 2021, two Manson theories resurfaced. The first is that there's a CIA connection to Charles Manson, and that when you listen to Charles Manson in interviews and he's just like babbling on and talking about circles, prison doesn't begin or end at the gate. Prison is in the mind. Like when he's just rambling on about that, that he was actually coached and trained and influenced by people who were working for the CIA. And it came from the introduction of Scientology into prisons where he could have learned about all types of manipulation tactics and more or less psychological warfare in some ways. And it's not to say that Manson was a brilliant mastermind. I mean, even I would not go that far. I mean, I always try to weigh the merit of the ideas, but I don't think that Manson was a brilliant mastermind. But could he have been influenced by people who were introducing these ideas in prison to see what happened? And the long story short is that the theory that has been resurfaced is that Charles Manson, as well as the members of his family, were products of MK Ultra, and that there's this race between the United States and the Soviet Union to get to the moon, right? The space race? I'm sure you know that one. But there's also a race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union to create an army of programmed killbots who can just spring into homicidal action at will or under certain conditions, and that they can become super soldiers. I mean, they could become very intense covert commandos. They're doing psychological experimentation on people, and um, they want to see what happens, and that the Manson family... And it wasn't Charles Manson who committed the Tate LaBianca murders. There's actually a different Charles that is involved to a greater extent, and his name is Charles Tex Watson. Tex Watson's legal name was Charles. So the whole package that Brian Davis was trying to get, and he's asking this as a challenge question, what is the significance of Tom O'Neill's chaos? All right, he found all of these things, or his research supported a lot of previously held beliefs. But it centers on something about how you have the same psychiatrist working with MK Ultra, and is also working with the free clinic in San Francisco. Hate Ashbury, not Ashbury Hate, thank you Pedro Fernandez for correcting me, the free clinic in Hate Ashbury. And they're doing these things where people may have been exposed to LSD and like all types of LSD experiments. I don't even want to go off on the details too much as well, but I think you can get the idea in that did Charles Manson get exposed to this type of drug use from this doctor, Jolly West, who was, as we said, MK Ultra, the free clinic that Charles Manson went to, and then 
You have the Tate LaBianca murders happening later on. You have Charles Manson's cult-like following happening later on. Charles Manson was definitely a precursor to the internet because it's almost like he knew that he was going to become a web celebrity. He knew that by getting in front of television cameras and acting really silly that he was going to get a following. I'm a tramp, a bum, a hobo. I'm a boxcar and a jug of wine. Like, all of that. It's almost... I mean, it's perfect for the internet. That's how I got pulled into Charles Manson, because of, because of those things, because of his epic question, because of his epic answer. And um, there are also some uh, important things, though, to remember about Charles Manson. And I'm, I'm sure if you've looked into the Manson family, the Tate LaBianca murders, you may have encountered that Charles Manson was a schizophrenic, and he was diagnosed as a schizophrenic. But I also heard from Brian Davis that um, that was actually in 1963. That date had escaped me. I mean, because you would know that, okay, if somebody's been arrested and they're in jail for life with the possibility of parole, mind you, Manson had numerous parole hearings as well as all of um, the other people that in the family, I mean, Bruce Davis, Leslie Van Houten have been granted parole many times, although it was overturned by the governor. But Manson was diagnosed as a schizophrenic in 1963, five years before a lot of the activities of the family in 68, six years before the Tate LaBianca murders. So this guy, who is rambling on about things, he's definitely not someone who is in extreme control of his faculties, and he's somewhat of a high functioning schizophrenic to to um to that credit but i will answer the question what is the significance of tom o'neill's chaos but first we have to get to the second part about why this is important we said that there are two theories about manson that have resurfaced and that is that maury terry wrote the book the ultimate evil which was heavily discussed in the netflix special sons of sam looking at how there could have been this underground satanic cult movement called the Children that was all about murder and, or, I mean, satanic, I don't even know if that is the right word to um, do. It sounds more like just about evil. And they could even be persuaded to kill for profit. They could be persuaded to kill for various reasons. And Maury Terry believed that the murder of Arliss Perry, which happened in uh, 1974, was also the um, connected to this group, the children. That was um, the Stanford University um, murder, where um, Arliss Perry was found. Um, she had been raped and uh, sexually assaulted with a candle, and there was another candle between her breasts. But there has been um, DNA evidence that linked someone to that crime. 45 years later, and his name was Stephen Crawford. He was the security guard who found her body, and we were talking about Arliss Perry last week. So Maury Terry thought there was this underground cult-like network going on between the Son of Sam shooter, David Berkowitz, as well as other people who are involved with that. I mean, he thinks there are multiple shooters in David Berkowitz, is a Son of Sam set up, and then there's also... Charles Manson on the West Coast, and they're all linked through this underground set of ideas. All right, so that has resurfaced. My biggest answer to the question, what is the significance of Tom O'Neill's chaos? It is that these are not the first observations. These are not the original ideas of anyone. The Sons of Sam docuseries on Netflix, Tom O'Neill's chaos, we need to remember that these ideas have been around for decades, and they, they are not new. If you go on YouTube and you pull up some of the episodes of Dialogue Conspiracy, you will hear Mae Brussel talking about these exact same things in the 1970s about Charles Manson. She's saying that, the thing about the CIA, that Charles Manson may have been an informant. And that is one of the big pieces of Tom O'Neill's chaos. Like, you want to talk about the significance, the important conclusions... He almost cemented the fact that Charles Manson could have been a CIA informant or an informant for someone. I really got ahead of myself there because what he was doing was he described it as he was letting someone read his um, file on Manson and he just said, chicken shit, chicken shit, chicken shit. This guy should not have gotten out of jail. He was an informant. 
an informant, meaning just they're using him to collect and gather information. And Tom O'Neill's question to that was, an informant for whom? And the response was, you will never know. It could have been the CIA or it could have been another type of um, similar operation going on. Because have you guys ever uh, noticed this? When you look into um, something to do with a CIA conspiracy theory, you often find that some people say, well, no, it wasn't the CIA, but somebody may have been connected to the CIA, but it was actually something kind of similar, or it's a different governmental organization, the FBI for one. How about the military? Or even you can get into the levels of local law enforcement or state troopers, and there can be all types of um, all types of interconnection between these governmental departments. So, I think that that's the most important thing that we need to remember. I mean, Maury Terry's The Ultimate Evil, that's, that's self-explanatory. They didn't pull that stuff out of thin air for Netflix. It came from Maury Terry's book, The Ultimate Evil. And it, I said, though, if you do watch uh, Sons of Sam on Netflix, they're going to have a very, very long-winded introduction on David Berkowitz, The Son of Sam Murders. And it's good to really familiarize yourself with the names of the victims and how the crimes were committed. But it took a long time before they even introduced Maury Terry as a person who was talking all about um, this link to the shadow network of cult-like activity. But these are not new things. These are very old. A lot of people have been aware of this stuff. If you ever do listen to the Tate LaBianca radio program, I really noticed that the host Brian Davis is absolutely, adamantly, 100% against the thinking of Maury Terry, against any type of satanic cult at all in the Manson family case. And um, as far as looking at the um, actual motives for the Tate LaBianca murders, a lot of people, such as Ivor Davis, um, think that there was a drug deal that had gone wrong. Ivor Davis, who has a very similar name, but um, many people named Davis in the Manson family world, he said that he has followed it for 50 years, and he has always stood by the theory that it was a drug deal gone wrong. I mean, I still haven't seen anything that has uh, convinced me from the more conventional narrative that it was Charles Manson wanted to get revenge on society and the establishment for denying him the ability to enter into the... um well, the world of the musical elites and such. And it's not so much about getting a record deal, entering the world of musical elites, and the whole thing about Terry Melcher breaking a contract, or that he felt cheated, and that he thought by getting his uh, Manson family followers to commit the crimes that it wouldn't come back on him. Now, the reason why I mentioned that um, Brian Davis was opposed to the whole cult leader theory, or the satanic cult theory, or Maury Terry's ultimate evil theory is because he actually brought up something that I hadn't heard in its exact words, and that was that Charles Manson may have simply wanted to burglarize the Tate House on Cielo Drive. Charles Manson may have simply wanted to burglarize the House of Rosemary and Lino LaBianca the next day, and that it's actually Tex Watson who is high on drugs and just goes out of control, and Charles Manson either didn't care or didn't um, think it would come back to him, or maybe he um, just could not control Tex Watson because Tex was some um, superior, superiorly more more physically strong than Charles Manson, and um, he could have easily destroyed him. But I mean, they still have this type of leader follower dynamic going on, and the reason why he thought that um, Charles Manson would have only wanted to burglarize the house and that. Tex Watson um, just simply lost control was they would have had so much more to benefit by getting money as opposed to killing people. I mean, I mean, if you're stealing things of value, then those can be sold and then that can deal with all sorts of aspects of um, solving all kinds of problems. And also, I mean, he has his own research and He's saying that he believed Charles Manson wanted to leave the Spawn Ranch. He wanted to leave a lot of the people, and um, he wanted to go out into the desert and just live um, live without a lot of the previous uh, connections that he had in life, particularly to motorcycle gangs. 
because Charles Manson is connected to, um, well, definitely one, um, motorcycle gang, the Straight Satans, they're the ones who are involved with the drug deal from Gary Hinman, and, um, there's a, possibly a drug deal that had gone wrong with the murder of Gary Hinman, which happens before the Tate LaBianca murders, and I don't mean to ramble too much, so I'll try to, uh, stay focused a little bit. And the next point was that, uh, Brian Davis had something to say about Maury Terry's ultimate evil, and that is that he said it's entertaining, but he doesn't believe it. I will go one step further. Maury Terry, the ultimate evil, the children, the cult, the shadow network of cult-like activity. It's almost uh, not enough to say that, okay, it's entertaining, but I don't think it's true. I still think that Maury Terry could have been onto something. There could have been something there. Maury Terry may have been on the right pathway, and you can always learn things when you're exploring those types of theories. Maybe you've heard the expression, with a conspiracy theory, there's always a grain of truth, right? People say that all the time, and I'm like, oh no, uh-uh, it's not just a grain of truth, it's like a blend of facts and falsehoods. Or if you actually want to look at some of these um, things that we talk about in the Psychology of Conspiracy Theory episodes, and there are numerous on this channel, what some people say is, the conspiracy theorists are using real facts. I mean, I'll never forget that. Back when Alex Jones was on YouTube still, and before he got deplatformed, somebody just left that in the comment, in the comment section on InfoWars. And they said, so many people are critical of this guy, Alex Jones, but when he talks about stuff, mostly he's just giving facts. Conspiracy theorists have real facts. What did I just say? Conspiracy theorists have real facts. The problem with people like Alex Jones, and to a certain extent the problem with people like Maury Terry, although he's way, way, way more articulate. The problem is, though, they get accused of trying to connect these facts with fictitious connections. All right, then you have the murders at Cielo Drive, you have the murders of Lino and Rosemary LaBianca, and then you're going to create this fictitious narrative. Ah, they were all in together in the same organized crime ring. Well, wait a second, is that really true, or is that just that storytelling mechanism that we talked about being implanted into reality? Well, what do you think about any of that stuff, and um, Maury Terry, The Ultimate Evil, or Tom O'Neill's Chaos, and Charles Manson as a CIA informant. What do you think about any of that? Please put your ideas in the comments section below. And one more time, we'll be right back. At this time, I would like to talk about some of the ways in which you can help Black Box Online Radio. This channel relies on your support, and the best way you can help out is just by listening to some more content. If you like what you hear, you can hit that like button, subscribe, and share with your friends on social media. But I should also say that Black Box Online Radio now has a Teespring page, and there will be some links in the description box. Please feel free to check out some of the merchandise that is available. Almost all sizes and colors are listed. So... You can also help out by going over to the Zodiac Killer channel and watching the documentary series Obsession Into Darkness, parts 1, 2, and 3. I was one of the contributors for that, and you can see some other great Zodiac content on the Zodiac Killer channel. And yes, there will be a part 4 of Obsession Into Darkness at some point in the future. And for now, let's get back to the show. Okay, hello, and we are back. So, I did something recently that I have not done in a very long time. And that is to just sit down and watch an episode of Forensic Files. I was actually doing a little bit of channel surfing, like, remember that from back in the day when you would see what's on different channels of live television? And I came across an episode of Forensic Files that was talking about the serial killer Maury Travis, full name Maury Troy Travis. And I had always wanted to learn more about him because I found that there were a couple of unique elements of the story of Maury Travis when I had looked into his stuff casually before. And ever since I watched that episode of Forensic Files, I've been following along a little bit with um, what, um, what uh, transpired in his life. Maury Travis was a serial killer that operated in St. Louis, Missouri in the early part of the new millennium. They estimated that he killed between... Uh, 12 and 17 people, maybe even more. And he was also a serial killer 
who uh, made snuff films, and um, at least one of them has been somewhat well-preserved. So, with Maury Travis, he is somebody who got caught in a very odd way. First, I should say that I notice he doesn't seem to have a very solid serial killer nickname. That's quite surprising. Other than being the killer from Hell's Basement, they often refer to this dungeon that he had under his house in St. Louis as a, um, well, as Hell's Basement. So, the Hell's Basement killer, a killer from Hell's Basement, and um, maybe some other variants of that will also come up in the media. But I thought it was so surprising that um, not only did he get caught, but the way that he got caught, he mailed in a letter bragging about his crimes, and he was also including a map, and a map of, you know, a location that could have been relevant to the mystery of who is this Hell's Basement killer, and he's not using that name, mind you. I shouldn't be too theatrical, but because of the internet, they can see that this metal... This map had been downloaded from Expedia.com, and they went back through the IP addresses, and they found, eventually, which, you know, computer it had come from, and that, more or less, led to his downfall. It wasn't the murders that got him caught. It was downloading that piece of info from the internet and then mailing it in, mailing in this braggadocious taunt. And so just to read the letter real fast, it says... Dear Bill, nice sob story about Teresa Wilson. Write one about Green Wade. Write a good one, and I'll tell you where many others are to prove I'm real. Here's directions to number 17. Search in a 50-yard radius from the X. Put the story in the Sunday paper like the last. And um, as we said, um, the X talking about a map that had been downloaded from Expedia.com. And that led to his downfall. Maury uh, Travis would then go on to commit suicide, so he didn't serve uh, the entirety of any convicted term or anything, and he took lots of secrets to the grave with him. But just when you hear that type of letter, I will tell you where more are. I mean, number 17 is in a 50-yard radius from the X. He's taunting. He's bragging about it. And I have really began to notice since following the Zodiac Killer mystery that... These are just true crime cases where people write in letters very frequently. There are killers out there that write in letters because they want to brag about it. They want to create this type of three-way relationship among the murderer, law enforcement, and the journalist. You heard in that letter there, Maury Travis is telling someone to write a story about him, write a good one. It's that desire for not only attention, but also this person believes that they deserve a certain sense of recognition. I mean, Jack the Ripper wrote in letters, and then the Black Dahlia Avenger, the Zodiac Killer, David Berkowitz, Son of Sam, BTK, and Maury Travis, the Hell's Basement Killer. They, they, they're they doing this, and this is happening perhaps even more frequently than I can list off. It's not just five people. And that's the whole reason why I wanted to talk about Maury Travis for a little bit here. Because I think that this goes to show you that there are serial killers out there who do this. And even if we want to look at the hoax theory for Jack the Ripper, the hoax theory for the Zodiac Killer, it doesn't have to be a hoax. I mean, there are murderous individuals out there who write in letters taking credit for crimes because they think that they're so smart that they can get away with it. The difference between the Zodiac Killer and Maury Travis is the Zodiac Killer didn't have the internet. In fact, all of those um, examples that I cited, the, um, the Black Dolly Avenger, Jack the Ripper, the Son of Sam, and um, BTK, um, maybe not. Yeah, anyway... Um, the internet isn't involved with the vast majority of them, so it's hard to think, though, if the Zodiac Killer were alive in 2021, or he was trying to become a serial killer like that in 2021, almost certainly forensic science would have shut him down much more quickly. But back to the material for the AMA, the Ask Me Anything, I have one comment that came in on the episode CIA Talk Radio, and this is about Henry Kissinger comes to us from Eve Carson, who says, Interesting aside about Henry Kissinger, in the early 1980s, Kissinger applied to move into the River House, a very upscale New York apartment. George Webster, 
Webster's father lived there. I can remember George Webster talking about Kissinger getting blackballed. George Webster said if a single resident objected, an individual could not move in. George Webster is, of course, the father of Joan Webster, who disappeared from Logan Airport in Boston, Massachusetts, and was murdered in 1981. And um, he was, of course, connected to the CIA as well, hence the uh, appearance on CIA talk radio. As far as Henry Kissinger, I had a response to Eve Carson because I said, I'm not surprised Kissinger was involved with a big scandal in the 1980s. Maybe you'll remember the boys in the Carlisle Hotel. He was accused of pedophilia. I would expect even before that he had a bad reputation between the scandals and accusations of being a war criminal. And um, Eve Carson replied to me, Not surprising, the Carlisle was a regular haunt for the Websters. That was one of the first places I went with them, and when I met them for the first time. Bobby Short was the piano player for the Carlisle and happened to be from my hometown in Illinois. And yes, Eve Carson is the sister-in-law of Joan Webster, whom I said was the um, daughter of George Webster, so she has a first-hand connection to the family. About this scandal with Henry Kissinger in the Carlisle Hotel, it was talked very widely about in the 1980s, and there are two people that I've mentioned on the channel before that were very involved with this. One of them is Lyndon LaRouche, and the other is Allen Berg. The, Allen Berg would go on to be murdered by a right-wing extremist group known as the Order, but the murder of Allen Berg was the first time that I had talked about a true crime case here on the channel that was not an unsolved mystery, and I used to always reference it back in 2018. It's like when I talked about the murder of Allen Berg, just giving some commentary on the subject because of the different elements that were in at play. But he did talk a lot about Henry Kissinger and this scandal in which he was involved with pedophilia molesting boys at a place called the Carlisle Hotel. When Lyndon LaRouche was confronted about this on national television, the response that they gave to him was very simple. They said, Henry Kissinger does not have the time of day to even spend an hour with friends at the Carlisle Hotel, let alone be involved with all of these scandals that um, you're accusing him of. So, I'm not exactly sure what Kissinger was involved with in his personal life, or maybe a darker side of his personal life. These types of accusations definitely do enter into global elite circles, and in fact, that's one of the ways that people can be blackmailed if they are involved with these types of bizarre sex acts. I mean, have you heard of Jeffrey Epstein or something? He used to all be a crazy conspiracy theory, and then Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell came along, and then suddenly people realized that, hey, wait a second, all of these things are true. The concept of luring somebody in to an orgy. They get some type of political player to participate in an orgy or a weird sex act, and then all of a sudden, they're, they have blackmail on this person, especially if it were involving minors, which many of the Epstein victims were. A lot of the uh, victims of Jeffrey Epstein were around the middle school age, like 12, 13, and 14, and about Henry Kissinger. I do think that there perhaps is some type of mud-slinging accusation, the concept of throwing as much mud at the wall as you can and hoping that it will stick. What I think is more important is people were aware that bad things were going on. Some people view Henry Kissinger as a hero, and other view, uh, others view him as just absolute pure evil. And you heard that um, he got denied entry into that um, apartment complex because even if one single person disliked him, he wouldn't be allowed in. Of course, people are going to be opposed to... Um, any type of major political player, but even back in the early 1980s, his reputation was terrible. In the mid-1980s, not only was his reputation terrible, he was accused of being a pedophile. He was accused of doing all kinds of things behind closed doors because he's a powerful elite. And when I was talking about some of this last week um, on the episode CIA Talk Radio, there was one line that I forgot to mention as well. It was about Henry Kissinger and his connections to the oligarchy. And Webster Tarpley, who at the time was uh, working for Lyndon LaRouche, was featured on the program Crossfire in the 1980s. And he made a comment about how Henry Kissinger's father had 
connections to the KGB. And they said, no, he did not. I mean, the people who were challenging him, um, Tom Braden, I think Arno de Borgrav was the other one. And they were saying, Henry Kissinger's father was the superintendent of schools in a small town in Bavaria called Firth. And Tarpley's response was, his father was a member of the Bavarian Socialist Republic, and Kissinger renewed his father's connections through blackmail. See how blackmail is going in all directions. I mean, Kissinger can get blackball, and he can also blackmail people. A lot of these are accusations, but you really have to sift through them when you're just somebody who's sitting back and watching the evening news or pulling up old clips on YouTube. And the important thing to uh, remember is that that would mean that Kissinger is a little bit less of an oligarch, if that were true. And I want to entertain that in a hypothetical if, if, if. If that is true that Henry Kissinger's father was a KGB liaison, member of the Bavarian Socialist Republic, and that he had some serious connections across Eastern Europe that Henry Kissinger was able to exploit later on, that would go to show that the branches of oligarchy move out even more widely than we had originally anticipated. And then somebody like Kissinger, using his own intelligence, I mean, he was, and I mean, I think Kissinger is a bad person. And yes, he is more on the side of um, bloodthirsty and power-hungry uh, individual who is acting in a self-serving way. But instead, I think that somebody like him, who did have real intelligence, bloodthirsty, yes, power-hungry, yes, intelligent, yes, he can use that to rise up higher in the oligarchy, but it's not from zero. It's not the story of the guy who is just breaking into soccer games because the Jews aren't allowed to attend the football games. You see, I'm saying football and soccer at the same time. And then they find out that he's Jewish, so he gets beaten up. It's like, oh, that poor kid. Well, maybe he was a little bit more of an oligarch than we had originally uh, thought of. But the reason I'm that uh, the thing with the soccer games, let's just go with that word. The reason why that gets talked about is his biographer, Walter Isaacson, um, use that as an illustration of foreshadowing, if you will, saying that Kissinger wanted to see the football games. Damn it! He wanted to see the soccer games very badly because he's a big fan. So he would break into the games, and then he would get beaten up. And from that early age, he learned that might makes right. And then might makes right, well, what do you do when you're involved with the Vietnam War, for example? What do you do when you're involved with um, interacting with international relations? Might makes right kills a lot of people. So that's why people think that Kissinger is a bad person. Um, okay, yeah. And, um, Oh, actually, here's an interesting bit of trivia. I think it was in 1990 when Henry Kissinger became uh, the president of the World Cup at the time, or he's like the managing director and so on. I know I said it's an interesting bit of trivia, then all of a sudden I forgot the date. I'm, and I think it was 1990 for the uh, World Cup or something, and um, he gave the very famous line. He's like, I would just like to say one thing in German. If you talk about the Fußball Weltmeisterschaft, mein Vokabular is viel better. If you talk about the World Cup, my vocabulary in German is much better. And I don't know. I thought that was kind of funny. But I think I've been rambling on for long enough. If you have anything that you would like to share in the comments section below, please do so. You can now download the show for free at Launchpad DM, Black Box Crime and Government. It's available in the description box here. There's a link to that for the YouTube listeners. And anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Instagram, blackboxned88. And there's a link to my personal Facebook in the description box, as well as Black Box Online Radio on Facebook. Many ways to follow the show. And the best way you can support the show is just by listening. Feel free to visit Launchpad and download the show for free. Take it on the go anywhere and anyhow. But you can also visit the Teespring page and think about buying a t-shirt. Remember, being weird is not a crime. And also, some people say soccer, some people say football, and it does get confusing once you uh, start thinking about it. Anyway, that's all for me now. See you on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.